Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 259, featuring an interview with uh, two former SSI employees and some folks directly responsible for those uh, celebrated Gold Box uh, series of role-playing games, uh, Dave Shelley and Laura Bowen. Now this part of the interview, we talk about their uh, a new uh, Kickstarter-funded game called Seven Dragons Saga. And this is a, an effort to resurrect that Gold Box-style, classic, turn-based, tactical role-playing that uh, I, I love so much, and I'm sure a lot of you guys too. Anyway, I wanted to have them on to talk about this project, what they're planning, and answer some questions about the game. So it's a lot of great, great stuff. I know you're going to enjoy it. So without further ado, here is David Shelley and Laura Bowen. All right, folks, I am here with the uh, great David Shelley, the producer and lead designer for TSI, and uh, Laura Bowen, the graphics, uh, a graphics artist for SSI, and somewhat involved right in the, the new Seven Dragon Saga. Uh, they're both uh, veterans of SSI, folks responsible for some of the best CRPGs ever made, including, of course, the, uh, the Gold Box series, uh, which I, I took out for this. Uh, so now you're working on a, th a project called Seven Dragon Saga, right? That's Can correct. Tell me a little bit about that, uh, this, this new project. Uh, well, um, we got approached uh, about a year ago uh, to bring back some of the SSI elements of games since a number of other ones are starting to come out with some classic elements so wasteland 2 just came out the other day and, yeah. uh, you played that yet uh yep yeah, i'm about three or four hours into it already <laughs> <laughs> so um he approached uh some of us from ssi and uh i was particularly interested in the opportunity to get uh, back into rpgs and I brought in Paul Murray, who was uh, a longtime SSI guy, who was a uh, programmer and uh, designer on Wizard's Crown, Eternal Dagger, um, most of the Gold Box games, and on to Panzer General, uh, all of those. So uh, he also wanted to uh, get his chops back onto this game. So uh, Seven Dragon Saga is based off a system that uh, Keith Brewers and uh, I developed. Keith is yet another SSI alumni. Um, and it involves the um, party being able to be created by the player, a whole six-man team, classes, races, and all of that. And then turn-based tactical combat. Um, the storyline uh, revolves around the use of power, players represent an empire and are coming in at a medium level of power rather than the um, just the recruits with rusty swords and uh, okay. dangerous bats. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering, it sounded like from the description that you start off fully leveled, but there is some, there's going to be some leveling involved, right? Oh, yes, there are. It's really kind of a medium level of power it's so that uh, people will take you seriously. Plus, within the storyline, you have the ability to invoke the emperor's name and say, you know, I want to do this, you know, bow down to me, <laughs> which can have <laughs> good effects and bad effects. <laughs> so this is uh, a tabletop system that you designed with, with Keith. Is, is, uh, how does that compare to AD&D or what we're used to seeing in the, in the gold box games? Uh, well, D&D uh, &D used very much a pure level system. We're using a, uh, points-based system underlying our classes and levels so that you can get a lot more customization into your characters so that you can tweak which abilities you have, which skills you're going to use, and so on. So each one of your characters is not just the fighter, the cleric, the rogue, but each one can have additional aspects to that. In addition, we were looking at giving them abilities that were a little more spectacular on the tabletop and on the screen as well. The uh, ability to leap onto uh, pillars and shoot down on multiple enemies, large area of effect attacks, that whole kind of uh, splash and dazzle, which... Uh, cinematic. Cinematic, yes, thank you. <laughs> so it's going to have, you said it had turn-based tactical combat. Correct. You know, so would you put it more like a Wizard's Crown level of complexity or more of a... 
Yeah, I mean, it's got some of the Wizards found uh, interest in terms of the uh, positioning of the players, how they move about the battlefield, zones of control, um, height, cover. Um, we try to bring in a lot of the environment into the um, battle. A lot of the terrain will be destructible so that you can remove cover. Uh, you can create difficult terrain. And in certain zones, you'll be able to do more spectacular effects if you can identify what piece to eliminate or uh, manipulate. Yeah, it sounds a little bit, I'm kind of picturing sort of an XCOM. Yes. Like a, a system, is, is that one? A lot of it will be taken uh, kind of from that XCOM 3D style with some of the use of camera to add a bit of drama to the use of different powers. Uh, probably won't go quite as fancy with the camera work, more keeping to where you can actually see where your your whole team is and how it's operating. Uh, so when did you want to do this uh, project now? Is it just the time? Is, is it time you just want to, want to get back into it? <laughs> yeah, it was, a, it was an opportunity that came to me because uh, David Klein, who's the uh, head of the company, uh, brought uh, the first round of funding to us and said, you know, he was a huge fan of the SSI games when he was young and really wanted the opportunity to bring it uh, back. And since now self-publishing is, again, possible that uh, we don't need to go with an EA or... Uh, you know, a Japanese company or anything. We can uh, do what we want, and with using middleware such as Unity, uh, we can take care of a lot of the engine building just by utilizing their libraries, and we can focus much more on the gameplay. Um, I'd say our biggest difference from the old gold box games and so on is that our art budget's going to have to be a lot higher. Uh, yeah. I mean, especially with Wizards Crown and such. I mean, I was an artist on Eternal Dagger, and I'm no artist. So. <laughs> yeah, I remember him bringing home a uh, Commodore 64 and oh, telling yeah. me just what the limitations were. I, I couldn't believe it. I have a, an art degree, uh, and uh, this was long enough ago that there wasn't any digital art involved in that. I, I'm not even sure they had any uh, digital uh, classes. I, mean, I think it was under the computer science department rather than the art department. So he's showing me how you have these 8x8 eight eight pixel tiles and they're only two colors and you have to actually draw something within that. So I said, now, let me try that. And I <laughs> picked up this thing and started fiddling with it and uh, went on to a whole career in uh, computer game graphics. So are you thinking about putting this on a Kickstarter? Is it uh, going to be a Kickstarter fund? Uh... Yes, that's our intention. We're, mm -hmm. We've decided that um, just as SSI was self-publishing, we want TSI to be. And uh, also, I mean, we had a bit of connection with the uh, audience back in the SSI days because we had a live customer service line. So <laughs> we got to talk to actual players mm -hmm. and so on. And now with the Internet age, we can uh, contact and, you know, interact very quickly throughout the entire development cycle. So Kickstarter will bring us in that audience and uh, will help provide the next round of funding to bring it from its prototype stage into its finished level. So when are you planning to launch this Kickstarter? Uh, we're thinking about probably early October. Oh, okay, so just right around the corner. Yep, it's coming up. Uh, who's the? Who would you say is the target audience for this? Is it more people that grew up playing the gold box games and well, I mean, I certainly a... have a, a, a nod to them because, uh, you know, it's, it's our demographic and uh, that kind of tactical is certainly very familiar to them. At the same time, we think that by bringing in uh, a lot of streamlining of the user interface, uh, a lot of contextual stuff in terms of choosing what your options are and, and an improved graphic fidelity that uh, I think a new audience shouldn't be hard to attract uh, to this style, and of course, we're not pioneering this next generation. We've got uh, Wasteland and Torment and Pillars and uh, all of those to. Uh, yeah, it's get a wonderful time to be an RPG gamer. Yeah, it's a great time. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when they were out of style. I remember being told, "Not oh, that's a dirty word. Do not say those words." <laughs> uh, so, how's the? Is it going to be like the old? Uh, gold box games with your in first person view and then when you get into combat it switches to a nice symmetric view or how, how's that going to work? 
we're going to have uh, for long distance travel and exploration, we're going to be doing a strategic map. And so you'll you'll be a, a symbol and uh, be moving around, and things will pop up, or you'll get pulled into combats. Uh, then in the main um, levels, you'll be walking around in third person the whole time. Uh, so the camera will be up above you, uh, being able to see the party. You'll be able to rotate the camera, zoom in, uh, explore the world that way and not end up being stuck behind a pillar or something where you can't see yourself. Uh, and then when combat starts, it switches to turn-based combat. And uh, then characters go in initiative order until the battle's over. Mm -hmm. um, so there will be random encounters? Oh, definitely. Okay, yeah, that's, uh, that's good. I like this. Yeah, including uh, the camp at night type of uh, encounters where you're players uh, have their armor off and that sort of thing. I mean, it harkens back to the old uh, gold box uh, interrupt of your sleep. <laughs> we were just talking about that the other day. That was actually a fun, I always enjoyed those things. Cause it, it made resting and kind of fun, right? A little, you'd always be <laughs> yeah. wondering. I, I mean, this could be, uh, <laughs> this could go south quickly because your people are already sort of wounded, right? And then you're... Yeah, you'll have a, a long-term uh, resource, uh, a trauma that will weaken your characters. And so you'll have a reason to rest and then you'll have to choose where to do that because if you do it in the middle of a main track of the uh, enemy, you'll end up not, <laughs> not getting a whole lot of sleep. <laughs> what kind of monsters are there going to be? Oh, um, we'll have uh, a number of uh, humanoid races, uh, a goblin-type groups. Uh, there'll be humans. Uh, we also have a number of uh, more animalistic creatures in development. Um, and uh, there's a golem race and so on that uh, people end up dealing with later on in the game. Okay, so uh, here's a question from Gabor. Uh, Gabor Damjan, he's asking, where did the martial arts angle come from? He also wants to know if you like martial arts movies. Oh, yes. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of uh, the martial arts movies. Uh, it's simply that uh, exaggeration of, of physical style. The, uh, I'm a big fan of comic books, so uh, you know, the hero, heroic battles and so on are a big deal for me. Uh, I have a, an interest in some of the anime stuff. And what that's basically informing is a bit of a more international look to the characters. Uh, we have characters based on Asian uh, cultures, ones on African cultures, and so on. And uh, also in terms of, of some of the more exaggerated uh, range of powers in terms of being able to leap across the battlefield, being able to turn invisible and appear behind your enemy. Um, all of those sorts of things which add a lot of cinematic and... Um, visual uh, eye candy to the product. Would you compare it to Jade Empire? Uh, we've looked at that one and uh, we're taking you know some Asian elements in terms of, of those abilities and such but we're not setting it in a purely Japan or China um, background of the world. The world itself is uh, fairly Western fantasy um, so you won't have to worry about the specific understanding of specific cultures of a, of a China or a Japan. Uh, it'll, uh, otherwise, it'll follow pretty much in the style that you see uh, modern games. I was sort of reading, sounds like you're going to have factions, uh, political yes. factions. Is that going to be similar to the, you know, the Fallout series? Uh, yeah, I mean, it has definite elements you, you see in, in Fallout and so on in terms of who you want to... Uh, become allies with and who you want to piss off will affect how the game uh, unfolds. Uh, in terms of the use of power with the game, we want to be able to have you sort of make large changes to the political situation if you uh, make the effort, whether you're trying to uh, calm everything down and make the emperor happy and so on, or if you just want to achieve your main goals and don't care about who gets hurt, you may trigger factions to start to oppose you, start to oppose the Empire, there could be uh, civil war elements that can be created. Um, so who your enemies are and such is affected a lot by who you choose to uh, befriend and who you choose to annoy. <laughs> are these, are there, is there going to be a faction that's clearly the good guys or have you started um, doing that thing where there's, you know, every faction has some... Every faction has evil. some reason with uh, that you're going to be able to deal with. Um, 
certainly the main kind of uh, behind the scenes darkest enemies. Uh, probably not going to be dealing with them terribly much on a faction basis, but in terms of the uh, locals and um, the Empire and so on that uh, will deal a lot with the day-to-day, -day, those guys will have all have their reasons for why they're doing what they're doing. Are you planning to have the, a journal, adventurer's I, journal, and have people look up well, probably, passages? Well, <laughs> We probably have uh, some elements in terms of background um, almanac or encyclopedia type stuff, simply because that sort of harkens back to the gold box. But we're not going to say if you want more, go check page thirty-five. Uh, <laughs> what about a code wheel? Are you going to have the, the code wheel? Uh, <laughs> I always like the code wheel. Oh, I remember all those copy text things. I got the code wheel. Yeah. And where is? Oh, there it is. Yeah, all, all this is your Kickstarter. Uh, yeah, we could do this. Reward there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's yeah, actually. Well, they call those pledge rewards. Or, yeah, the pledge know. rewards. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's cool. Uh, so uh, you said the classes. You it sounded like you're saying that you're not really going to be funneled into a particular class, right? Um, yeah, essentially what we're doing is there's a, um, in order to get into the game fairly quickly, there's an overlay of classes and races that have, uh, you know, they help provide a good background and a look for each of the characters. But once you've created the character by choosing your race, class, and specialty, you'll be able to uh, take a step underneath, which is a customized level, which will let you actually look at the exact point totals that are uh, involved, and you can say, okay, well, I don't want this character quite as strong. I want this character to actually be, to focus on speed, and so I'm going to move up his movement capabilities. And uh, I've got this big fighter, but I'd like him to actually be able to have the thief-type skills. So I will remove his capability at counterattacking and use those points to build him into a hybrid with fighter and, and thief capabilities. Um, just giving people the entire uh, point total and say, go ahead and build six characters uh, yeah. is, is not a very practical solution for, <laughs> for the start of a game. Yeah, you need some structure. <laughs> so. yeah, I remember that used to take quite a while with these games here, creating that first party. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, especially since with the random rolling, you'd want to uh, just keep going and going and going. Yeah, and roll, roll. Was trying like, to get all 18s and everything. Right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, there's no 8s. I've got a 14 and a bunch of 16s and two 18s. I'll go. Yeah, <laughs> Next character. Yeah, well, it was supposed to be D&D. &D, and that's the way that was, yeah, that was the, I mean, D&D &D now has its own point system for stats. And so yeah, yeah. So I saw 5th edition still has the dice rolling <laughs> as an option. So have you talked to Joel Billings about any of this? Or... Uh, yeah, we've been in contact with Joel. Uh, Paul was uh, his roommate back in the day during the SSI stuff, so they still keep in contact from time to time. Uh, he's always been a big war game guy, and he's got his two by three games and uh, enough money from the sale of SSI to uh, to do exactly what he wants, which is design and develop and help others develop uh, highly detailed strategy games. He's wished us uh, good luck with it, and uh, you know is eager to see what we do, but he doesn't want to be involved any further than that. <laughs> If this uh, project is, is successful, are you going to do another one afterwards? And oh, definitely. Uh, I think uh, you stick with the same the same setting or explore uh, some other uh, types of realms. Probably do a series in the Seven Dragon Saga universe, and uh, at the same time, I'm going to explore options to uh, either do uh, other people's intellectual property if uh, we can leverage our engine into uh, doing that. You know, uh, I wouldn't mind going back and revisiting D&D &D if uh, the opportunity presented and it, it made sense. Um, and then, you know, we have you know, a few dozen ideas of what we could do with our independent projects as well. Yeah, that's uh, pretty interesting. So you'd, you'd be willing to license your, the engine that you make for this game? To... Uh, yeah, I think so, because, uh, you know, it gives an opportunity to uh, be able to focus more again on uh, the story and uh, just the world of the characters. If you have an established uh, game system already built. If the engine's there, why not utilize it to tell another story? Mm -hmm. 
Does it, you have a name for the engine? Um, no, we don't have a formal name for it yet. It's, it's currently it's just with our current title. So <laughs> whether we name it something separate and uh, package it up, uh, we haven't decided. Let's see, did you say that was? I thought I. I thought I'd written, oh yeah, Unity 3D engine is what you're using, right? Yeah, we're going to use the Unity 3, 3D engine in their libraries for uh, the first portion of it, and then obviously we'll have to, you know, customize it a whole lot to make it do what we want it to do, but then we'll have something that's uh, useful. Yeah, with well, Unity, it'd be easy to port it to all the different platforms too, right? You... Exactly, yeah, that's uh, a longer term goal. First, we're going to focus on the PC, Mac, Linux systems. Uh, just to keep our focus narrow and uh, also to move it to mobile or move it on to console, I think that you should really revamp your UI and your general player experience. So once we have it done, then we can look at the, moving it to that. I don't, wouldn't want to port a keyboard and mouse uh, interface to, the, uh, to a touch screen and I wouldn't want to hybridize the screen for uh, PC player experience. Let's hope we'll get the Commodore 64 version. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be really That's... cool. <laughs> Do we still have one of those around the house? Do we get rid of those? I don't think we have a Commodore still. No. Yeah. I've gotten rid of the Sega Genesis, too. <laughs> no, the Genesis is. Oh, is that? How... Okay. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering if you have a little shrine in your, your place there. For... <laughs> oh, it goes way back. Yeah. Well, is there anything else you wanted to say about the Seven Dragon saga before we move on? Um. I think we've given the high points for it, so uh, we can move on to uh, other topics. All right, so we're ready to talk about some of these gold box games. <laughs> you know, I, I thought this would be pretty funny. So I, I was looking through these these boxes, and I found a, uh, the Game Trivia Contest. Uh, to celebrate Pools of Darkness, the fourth and final volume, uh, we're having a contest. What do you, let's see what you win here. A trip for two to the Gen Con Game Fair. <laughs> so I, was, I wanted to see if you, uh, if you could... Remember any of these? Because <laughs> I don't think I... I know a couple of these. Let's see. So in AD&D's Pool of Radiance, what are the trolls tossing in the slums? Uh, A, tossing salad. B, tossing sacks of grain. Or C, tossing their cookies. <laughs> <laughs> the sacks of grain, I do believe. Yeah, I think it is. The... Yeah, in the beginning of the game, who meets you at the dock? Oh, what was his name? Uh, he introduces you and then he takes yeah. you on to the uh, well it's definitely not Flipper or William Shakespeare <laughs> no it's not so it must be Roth that's it yep yeah. anyway it's fun so you, do you remember this trivia contest uh, uh, just just barely uh, with uh, during Pools of Darkness I was initially on the Dark Sun projects and before I got uh, pulled back in to, to do a bunch of the design work as, as it got uh Toward his due date. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I haven't quite decided what I'm going to put on the uh, next episode of Matt Chat. I've got quite a few uh, interviews sitting on my hard drive here. We've got uh, the rest of that Tom Hall interview. Uh, we've got one with Susan Manley, also of uh, SSI. Great stories there. And we've got Robert Woodhead of uh, Wizardry. And those are just the ones that I can uh, remember. There's probably a couple more. Uh, so what I'm going to do is stick them up on the uh, uh, Patreon site and let you guys choose You know who you want to see next. It's kind of a big backlog. I want to get to it. But uh, also we have the rest of this interview with uh, uh, Laura Bowen and Dave Shelley that we could put on too. So I'll let you guys decide. And whatever you uh, vote on, uh, that's what we'll have up uh, next. Oh, let's see. What else? Uh, <clears throat> Well, before we get to the news, I want to thank you very much, of course, for your continued support of the show. It really means a lot to me, guys, uh, all you folks for supporting me on Patreon. As you know, that only takes a couple minutes to set up. I also, though, uh, wanted to uh, announce a sort of special treat uh, for you folks. What I'm going to do is when I get to 25,000 subscribers on YouTube, I want to make a special, uh, basically a little uh, feature film about the Gold Box series going to have reviews of all the games in the gold box, a little about the history, the context, uh, my personal stories about them, and uh, you know, sort of commentaries. In addition to uh, interview snippets with uh, various folks that worked on them, it's going to be a lot of fun. It's gonna, I'm not going to uh, charge anybody for this. It's just going to be a reward for everyone uh, when I hit 25,000. That's uh, quite a ways away uh, as of now, so if you want to see that special sooner rather than later, then uh, what I need you to do is just get on Facebook, Twitter, 
or uh, whatever you use and try to let some people know about the show uh, people that would like this sort of thing if they just <laughs> even knew match had existed so i'll uh, depend on you guys for that uh, but i think it's going to be a lot of fun a lot of you have been wanting me to do something like this for quite a while so uh, help me to get there by spreading the word all right what about the news news from the map cave <laughs> quite a bit of news it's like this golden golden age of uh, role-playing games is, uh, <laughs> right now. Uh, I've been playing Wasteland 2. I'm going to do my next uh, retrospective on that. It's a little early to say, but I'm definitely enjoying what I've played so far. I'd love to hear what you guys think. Uh, let's see, what else? Um, also, Gauntlet is out. There's a remake of the classic Gauntlet uh, arcade role-playing game, I guess you could call that. You might remember I reviewed that one way back in Matt Chat 19, so... That's on Steam. It's four-player co-op. Looks like it's... Uh, I haven't played it yet, but the trailers look pretty good. I'd like to hear what you guys think uh, about that one. Also, there's a Grey Walker's Purgatory, a turn-based post-apocalyptic game. <laughs> Sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? Uh, this is up on uh, Kickstarter right now if you'd like to support these guys. It's looking pretty good. You know, I'm, I'm sure that once we finish uh, playing Wasteland 2, we're going to want to immediately play another post-apocalyptic turn-based game. So uh, this is probably our best bet for that. Uh, so I'll put the link up there. You can go check out the Kickstarter. Uh, but it looks pretty solid. Uh, also, the Paradigm Surreal Adventure, uh, point-and-click adventure, uh, sort of zany point-and-click adventure game. Um, pleased to say that has uh, met its goal already, and they've already hit three stretch goals with this thing. They're getting close to the fourth stretch goal, uh, it's just really encouraging to see this. There's a lot of interest in these old point-and-click adventures. <laughs> Far from dead, as the uh, mainstream gaming media would have you believe. But still a week to go. So if you like those old point-and-clicks, I suggest you look at this uh, paradigm thing. Maybe help him reach his uh, fourth stretch goal. I think that'd be pretty cool. They're already going to have uh, lots of voice acting and lots of cool stuff. Okay, I think that's it for the news. Uh, so what about that ale of the week? Well, I've got another one in a can here. This is the Hips Don't Lie. <laughs> and it took me a while to figure out what they mean by this title. But it's a, it's a Bavarian-style vice beer, and it's brewed with rose hips and honey. Now, usually rose hips and honey don't spring to mind when I think about a beer, so I'm kind of curious about that. Uh, let's see, craft beer, handcrafted. Uh, this one's out of the Lucette Brewing Company out of... Minamoni, or Minamoni, probably pronouncing that wrong, Wisconsin. And there's a pretty, there's a pretty big write-up on here. It's kind of cheesy. <laughs> I won't bother you with that. It's got the co-founder signatures on it. What is this? Reason clears and plants the wilderness of the imagination to harvest the wheat of art. Well, that's kind of nice, isn't it? Uh, let's see if there's any information about the beer. 6.2% alcohol, so not bad. A little bit, uh, I guess it's somewhere in the middle. A little stronger than the Budweiser, but, you know, it's not going to be overpowering. So anyway, let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this Hips Don't Lie here in the rather excellent drinking horn. <sighs> I've been smelling it. You can definitely smell that, uh, the wheat and the honey um, aromas in this. A little bit of a cherry uh, like scent as well. Nice color on this, as you can tell. <laughs> oh, is that you can't tell? Uh, well, that's because my drinking horn is opaque. You know, some folks would rather drink beer than look at it. Always kind of amuses me those uh, beer reviews where they keep going on about the, the color of it and the, uh, the number of bubbles. Like the, it's a particularly fine urine sample here. You know. Anyway, let's give this a taste. Mm. Nice and foamy, very sweet. I definitely taste those that, that the the honey here. It's very very sweet actually. Uh, I don't know what a rose hip tastes like, but I don't notice any strange uh, wangs or anything to the flavor here. It actually tastes really good. Let's try it again. Yeah, so you know it's a really well balanced wheat. Uh, very sweet little cherry uh, flavor on this. It's kind of a um, yeah, there's a little something there to the flavor. Maybe that is the rose hips I'm tasting. It's a little bit of an unusual flavor to this uh, that you wouldn't taste in most uh, wheats. Let me try it one more time. It 
and it's overall really, really nice. It's a light, refreshing. Uh, you don't really taste the alcohol. It's relatively, I put it more on the sweet side. I really no bitterness at all. A pretty solid choice. It's a little thin. Um, you like something a little, a little bit thicker maybe, but uh, for a wheat, uh, this would be perfect for a, a real hot summer day. You can come along with something uh, light and refreshing. And so I'm going to go a full five out of five drinking horns on this. Uh, hips don't lie. A really solid choice. They didn't overdo it with the, the honey and the rose hips. Uh, they just kind of got it just right, so it makes it a little more interesting than just the uh, typical wheat. So I really enjoyed this. Okay. <clears throat> uh, let's wrap this up with a quotation. I've been doing a lot of... <laughs> heavy reading uh, lately, but I found a pretty good quotation here in one of them. Uh, this is a from an article called The Culture Industry by uh, Horkheimer and Adorno. I usually don't uh, try to parse you know, articles like this, but I just thought this particular quotation uh, just sort of had a truth to it. You know, it really kind of struck me. And uh, it's kind of weird, too, so I thought that was pretty cool. But anyway, here it goes. Maybe you, can, you, maybe you guys can interpret this, too. All right. <clears throat> The great artists were never those who embodied a wholly flawless and perfect style, but those who used style as a way of hardening themselves against the chaotic expression of suffering. <laughs> Not quite sure what that means exactly, but I thought you guys might have fun with it. Anyway, hope you enjoyed that and see you guys next week. Star, Vincent's my name, sharpshooting's my game. Try me.